Welcome to the Places and Profiles podcast, the podcast that explores the issues, stories, and people that have shaped places into what they are today. Here's your host, Adam Kamek. If you're a creator, podcaster, blogger, or someone who is trying to make money online, then one of the most effective ways to do that will be to have an email list you can write to and sell to. ConvertKit is the email marketing platform designed specifically with creators and online business owners in mind. Get your email marketing set up with ConvertKit by going to placesandprofiles.com slash convert. Hi, everybody. In this episode, I spoke with Daniel Allen Butler about the Titanic. The Titanic, of course, has been a part of pop culture for decades, especially since the 1997 James Cameron-directed film on the subject. But the real story of the Titanic is different than that depicted by Hollywood. The Titanic, of course, has also been back in the news with the tragedy that occurred in June 2023 when the Titan submersible imploded. With that having happened so recently, what better time than now to take a deep dive and look back at the Titanic? I hope you enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Places and Profiles podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Daniel Allen Butler about the Titanic. Dan is a maritime and military historian and the author of 11 books, including Unsinkable, the full story of the RMS Titanic, Pearl, December 7, 1941, and Other Side of the Night, The Carpathia, The Californian, and The Night the Titanic Was Lost. You can follow his work at DanielAllenButler.org and on Facebook at Daniel Allen Butler Author. For more information, please check out the show notes page for this episode at placesandprofiles.com slash seven. Dan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Adam, for having me. I've um, been looking forward to this. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Uh, so let's I wanted, get into it. Yeah, let's, let's do it. So obviously a lot of ground that we want to cover. Before we get to the specifics of the Titanic, though, I want to take a step back. Uh, you've written two books about the Titanic. This is obviously something that you've spent a lot of time researching and learning about. So how did you become interested in the Titanic? Why do you have such a strong interest in this ship and what came of it? When I was nine years old, I started reading at an adult level. And the very first adult level book that I have ever read was A Night to Remember by Wolf and Gore. It was the introduction to the Titanic for a couple of generations of people. And something about Lord's presentation of the subject, the subject matter itself, uh, it just hooked me. It captured my, my imagination, my, my attention. Um, I really think that my intent to um, turn to a co- to writing as a career, and specifically writing history, began at that point, and it remained a fascination. I never quite got to the point of obsession, which which I'm grateful because there are there are people who just get a little too carried away with their, their, their love of all things Titanic to the point where I, I consider the obsession. I never got to that point. But uh, the fascination stuck with me from the time I was nine years old, right up until really until the present. Okay, so let's uh, let's dive in then, since you have this fascination and this deep knowledge base on the Titanic, and let's go back before the ship. Uh, leaves England in 1912 before it sets out on its maiden voyage. Um, And of course, that also happens to be its final voyage. And let's just go back to the origins of the Titanic. So what brought about the construction of the Titanic? And why was this such a monumental feat at the time that it was being planned and constructed? Okay, one of the the things that you need to keep in mind about the Titanic was just how immense this ship was. Um, we rattle off all the all the statistics: eight hundred eighty-two feet, six inches long, beam of ninety-eight feet, draft of thirty-six feet, displacement of fifty-five thousand tons, gross registered tonnage of forty-five thousand tons. They really don't convey just rattling the numbers off. The numbers do not convey just how big the ship was. The United States Navy, for example, would not build a ship of similar dimensions until the, really until the Forrestal class aircraft carriers in the 
the Titanic was physically bigger than an Iowa class battleship. She was part of an evolutionary process in the passenger trade on the North Atlantic, which was the most lucrative uh, of all the passenger lines uh, in the world at the time, because it was the busiest. It was the, it was the height of the immigrant trade. We're talking the first decade of the 20th century. It was the height of the, uh, the mass migration from Europe to the New World, and ships from mid 1890s began to grow immensely, uh, in, in, almost geometrically, in size. The, the Campania, for example, was a, which was the Cunard liner um, in 1895, displaced 18,000 tons. The, Lus- the Lusitania and the Mauritania, which came 10 years later, doubled that tonnage. A case where the four major competitors on the North Atlantic, which were the White Star Line, the Cunard Line, the two German lines, uh, Norddeutscher Lloyd and Hamburg America, were each building larger and faster ships. And it was a case of not just keeping up with the Joneses, but outdoing the Joneses, as it were. Haypag and uh, and nor it's your Lloyd wanted to build big, well, then Kennard would build bigger. And if Kennard wanted to build bigger, then White Star would build even bigger still. And you had this, this, this progression, as I say. Um, in 1895, the largest British ship in, the, uh, in service was the Campania, if memory serves me correctly, and she displaced 18,000 tons. Ten years later, that displacement was doubled in Mauritania and Lusitania, and five years after that, when the design for the Olympic class ships, the Olympic and the Titanic and the Gigantic, were being finalized, they were 10,000 tons larger still. So it was a very rapid progression, and it was all built on economics. The larger the ship, the lower per passenger operating cost, because you could carry more passengers on a larger ship than you could on uh, multiple smaller ships, so it was a uh, it was a money making proposition for everyone concerned. And the idea was when Bruce Ismay, who was the chairman of the White Star Line, and Lord Peary sat down over dinner in 1910 and began discussing the dimensions and the appointments of this new trio of liners that they were going to build. They had the Mauritania and the Lusitania very much in mind. They had the German competitors very much in mind. And their whole thinking was, you're going to outdo them in every possible aspect, in size, in luxury. The only concession we're going to make is in speed because we don't have the kind of engine technology that Cunard has available to it. Cunard had the assistance of the Royal Navy and experience of the Royal Navy with high-speed turbines in the Lusitania and Mauritania, and that was not available to the White Star Line. So they were so willing to settle for ships that were a little bit slower than their British competitors, but were still as fast or faster than anything else in the Atlantic run. And that was the gestation of what became the Olympic class of ships. Now, can you go into a little more detail about the construction of the Titanic, the sorts of materials that were used to construct the Titanic? Because uh, it's kind of seeped into popular culture that there was this notion at the time when the Titanic uh, set sail in 1912 that the ship was unsinkable. And obviously that proved not to be the case. But what was it about the materials and the engineering and the construction of the ship that would lead to that sort of impression? of the ship being unsinkable going into its maiden voyage? Well, first of all, Harland and Wolf, the uh, Belfast-based uh, shipyard, Belfast in Northern Ireland, never claimed that the Titanic was unsinkable. They called it practically unsinkable. Basically, what they maintained was that in any set of circumstances that they could conceive, the design of the ship would allow her to remain afloat 
in the event of an incident at sea. Now, there was a pivotal event in 1909 that had a tremendous influence on the design of the Olympic class ships, and that was the loss of the White Star Liner Republic. She was rammed by uh, an Italian liner called the Florida. She was basically T bombed, rammed directly amidships. And as bad luck would have it, right at the juncture of two watertight compartments, right at that bulkhead. So these two adjacent compartments are open to the sea. As they flooded, the water level in the hull rose above the top of the next adjacent watertight bulkheads and began flooding those compartments. And it just went on until the ship lost all its reserve buoyancy. So what was built into the design of the Olympic class ships was a series of 15 watertight bulkheads ran laterally across the ship about a stern that created 16 watertight compartments. And they were designed so that in should a similar incident happen to the Olympic class, one of the Olympic class liners and two adjacent compartments were flooding simultaneously, the weight of the additional water that was taken aboard would not cause the vessel to settle so deep that the water would rise above the tops of the, adja- of, of the next adjacent bulkheads. They were designed so that if any two adjacent compartments, actually any two compartments were flooded simultaneously, the ship would have a minimum of 10 feet of freeboard between the water line and the tops of the water type bulkheads. No one at the time could conceive of a situation where realistically more than two of the 16 water type compartments could be opened up to the sea. As it turned out, the way the bulkheads were arranged, the ship could float with the first four water type compartments flooded. There would still remain enough reserve buoyancy the water level in the ship would not rise to above the tops of the, uh, of the watertight bulkheads and pull the ship under. But if fifth compartment was open, that would change everything. But again, the best engineers at the time could not conceive of a situation where the first five compartments, watertight compartments on the ship, would be flooded simultaneously. So they were, they, the designs were based on practical experience and uh, what was considered to be a more than adequate safety margin was designed into the ships should they take on water. This is where the idea that they were practically unsinkable came from. Unfortunately, the public, in this case aided by the press, conveniently forgot that qualifier. Practically, theoretically, it was still possible, even though it was nobody could really conceive of how a disaster could befall an Olympic class ship sufficient to cause her to sink. Theoretically, it was still possible. Hence, the the qualifier practically. What happened was the general public just remembered the word unsinkable, and that was how the concept entered the public consciousness and became pervasive, it, it became gospel, even to the point where the White Star Line began to advertise the new ships as being unsinkable, even when the builders never tacitly, explicitly said that was the case. Well, and unfortunately, it proved to be in practice and not just in theory, it did prove to be sinkable. And we'll get to the sequence of events that led up to that here momentarily. Uh, but let's transport back to April of 1912, prior to the ship sinking, prior to the the ship even leaving from Southampton, England, and the buildup to this maiden voyage. So what sort of press coverage did this receive at the time? How was this event of the Titanic's maiden voyage viewed 
in 1912 prior to the voyage itself? And, and what sorts of expectations did people in the press, did um, ordinary individuals, did passengers have for how this maiden voyage was going to go? Uh, this is this has always been a source of amusement for me because it has become accepted in the mythology, if you will, of the Titanic that there was great fanfare and hoopla and much tub thumping, as it were, about the Titanic on her uh, departure from Southampton on April tenth, nineteen twelve, on her maiden voyage. The truth of the matter was. It was no big deal. See, the Titanic wasn't the first. The Olympic was the first of the three ships of the class. It was the Olympic that had received all the publicity and all the hoopla. The Titanic was just a was just a follow on. So yes, because of some uh, modifications to her interior layout, she was slightly larger in registered tonnage than the than the Olympic, and her accommodations were more luxurious than the Olympic, but it was not treated as a major, what we would today would call a major media event. It really wasn't getting a whole lot of national or international attention. It was just another ship leaving Southampton on her maiden voyage. But because of what happened subsequently, it has become ingrained in popular consciousness that a great deal of fuss was raised, a great deal of publicity was generated to celebrate the uh, the main voyage of the Titanic, when in fact it really was not that big. It was, it was not regarded as a big deal at the time. Was the maiden voyage of the Olympic regarded as a big deal when that happened uh, about a year before the maiden Absolutely. voyage of the Titanic? Absolutely. Absolutely. She was the largest ship in the world at the time by a considerable margin, 10,000 tons larger than her nearest competitor, almost 200 feet longer than her nearest competitor, which, which would have been the Lusitania Mauritania class, owned and operated by Cunard. And uh, it, she was an incredibly luxurious vessel in her own right. So this was, the Olympic was presented as the pinnacle of British shipbuilding at the time. And because she was the first of the class and because of her size, she was the one, Olympic was the one that got all the attention from the uh, national press. Now, you refer to the Olympic there as luxurious. How did the conditions on the Olympic compare to the conditions on the Titanic? And what were the conditions and accommodations like aboard each of those two ships? Well, interestingly enough, what was considered first class at the time on the uh, the Olympic and, and the Olympic class ships would today be considered almost Spartan by comparison to modern cruise ships. Now, let me make a distinction here. It is utterly incorrect for anyone to ever refer to the Olympic or her sisters or any of their competitors as cruise ships. They were not. They were passenger liners. The name meant that they would follow a direct line between two points on the globe to deliver passengers. They weren't just joy riding around in the ocean stopping at islands, having a good time. So there is very, very distinctive functions, very different construction requirements. To, in fact, to this day, there are, there are very distinct, very major distinctions between what will be certified as an ocean liner and what will be certified as a cruise ship and what the design and construction requirements for each happen to be because of the conditions that these ships are required to sail into. An ocean liner is expected to sail, if necessary, to sail through any kind of weather it encounters. Cruise ships, on the other hand, run away from weather. The last thing they want to do is get their passengers seasick. So the slightest hint of unpleasant weather, you'll find cruise ships making major course alterations to avoid it. 
passenger liners drove straight through. So I, that distinction is something that I think should be borne in mind when we're, we're talking about the difference between passenger liners and cruise ships. For one thing, in the Olympic class ships, despite the fact that it was first class, every cabin had its own bedstead, that is, its own freestanding bed. You didn't have bunks, you didn't have the sort of berths that had been common up to that point in almost every class on almost every ship. You had interior decors that were in in the individual cabins that were designed around specific architectural and and design styles. Regency, Old Dutch, New Dutch, Louis XIV, Louis XV, Louis XVI, all of these aesthetic styles would be reflected in, in the accommodations. But at the same time, there were some really interesting omissions. Most first-class cabins did not have private bathrooms. You had to use a communal bathroom. There would be bathrooms, obviously, separated by gender, that would serve four or five or six cabins. And uh, that was that was de rigueur. That was the that was accepted as the way it was. Nowadays, that would be completely unacceptable. But it was the way it was, it was done at the time. You move into the public spaces on these ships, and uh, that's when the luxury started really showing. Because there was an incredible amount of hand craftsmanship went into the interior. So not just in first class, but in second class, and even to some degree in third class. And third class is a special situation that I want to talk about in some detail. There was a, a remarkable amount of handcraft, hand carving, plaster work, painting, stained glass, that uh, was really more reflective of the public rooms of top-tier hotels, both on the continent and the United States. The whole idea was almost to, to try and make the passengers forget that they were at sea and that they were simply spending six days, five or six days, in a luxury hotel. So that was one of the distinctions of the Olympic class ships. The fact that there, were out, there was an a la carte restaurant on board the Titanic, which was a completely new innovation, i.e. you didn't have to go to the, to the dining saloon to take your meals. You could go to a genuine restaurant and order a la carte off the menu as if you were dining on Broadway. Now, one of the interesting things here is that second class in the Olympic class ships was so well appointed that it was compared to first class in most other ships in terms of the appointments, amenities, but you get into third class, and you get into a really special story. See, the Titanic was registered with the uh, British Board of Trade as an immigrant ship. Her sole purpose, as I said, was to transport passengers. And what was going to make money for the White Star Line in these ships crossing the North Atlantic was carrying third class passengers, immigrants from Europe to America. So you, you didn't, because this was the bread and butter of the White Star Line. The money earned by the first class passengers and second class passengers was a bonus, really. It was the 700, 800 immigrants that the ship would transport on each crossing that was really paying the way for these ships. So you did not have this case where the third-class passengers were crammed down into dark, dank, poorly ventilated, poorly lit, cramped holes in the ship. The third-class pass passenger areas were clean, they were spacious. What's really surprising is if you get your hands on a third-class menu from the Titanic for it, at, at any point in the crossing, you would be surprised how well the third-class passengers were eating. Not, not just any quantity, but the quality and the presentation of the food. The idea was, was very simple. If Patrick from County Cork had a good passage on a White Star ship and his 
brother Michael was considering taking passage to America. Well, Patrick's going to recommend, hey, take a white starship. I was taken very good care of. So the third class passengers were not herded about like cattle and, and just stuffed into the recesses of the ship. They were very well looked after, especially compared to as little as 50 years earlier when they really were stuffed into the holes of the ships. And good luck on making it. All right. So now that uh, we've looked at the classes and the accommodations for these different classes of passengers on the ship, can you go into some detail on specific passengers who were notable that were on the ship, either notable because of what they did or accomplished or who they were prior to going on Titanic or notable because of what happened aboard the ship and anything that uh, transpired in their lives after the fact? Well, probably the best example is uh, John Jacob Astor, who was arguably the wealthiest man in the world at the time. He was, the, the family had made a fortune in real estate, especially in, in New York. Most of the prime real estate in Manhattan, and especially in downtown New York, was owned by the Astor family. And Astor himself was an interesting character. Believe it or not, he was a science fiction writer. Novel, in which the uh, hero was uh, was contracted to straighten the tilt of the Earth's axis to the point where it was perpendicular to uh, the plane of the ecliptic, which would create a perfect climate year round on the Earth. I, I mean, that was the premise of the novel. He had just married scandalously uh, a woman who was barely a third his age, his wife Madeline. She had just turned eighteen. She was pregnant. Rumor had it that she had become pregnant before she and John Jacob uh, Astor actually wed. She survived the disaster. He didn't. There was Benjamin Guggenheim, who had made a fortune in smelting, that is, fabricating specialized metals for industry. And this is a time when industry is undergoing a huge transformation. There is an ever-increasing demand for more specialized metals uh, instead of just iron and steel. Because of the new various new applications, new technologies were demanding. There was Arthur Pucian, who was a uh, well-known Toronto businessman and a number of prominent Canadians on board. Uh, Charles Hayes, who was president of the uh, Canadian Pacific Railroad, was the uh, was making the crossing because he was looking to expand the Canadian Pacific Railroad by adding uh, steamships, a steamship line from the west coast of Canada into the Pacific to the Philippines, Japan, China. And he wanted to learn more about the detailed day-to-day operations of steamships so that he could apply that knowledge to his plans for expanding the his railroad's activities. You had people like Jacques Futrell, who was a novelist, was, uh, Frank Millet, who was uh, a, a very well-known painter at the time. Both men have pretty much been forgotten these days, but they were very well-known in your time. Here, of course, everyone knows about Maggie Brown. They mistakenly know her as Molly Brown, which she was never known as during her lifetime. She was a colorful figure, to say the least, very outspoken, very independent, and she was a charmer. She was such a diamond in the rough that uh, the the European upper classes just loved her because she could be so simultaneously so refined and so homely, not in the physical sense, but just in her earthy presentation. The woman was without pretense, and she's adorable. She spoke multiple languages which for an American was unusual at the time. She had made a, uh, a small fortune in mining in Colorado. And as I say, she was, she, she was such an original character. She's almost a force of nature, which is becoming immensely popular in the upper classes in Europe. There were people like the, the orchestra, the bandsmen, who were listed as, they were carried as second-class passengers. And they were some of the finest musicians uh, to 
work on the, uh, the North Atlantic run, which was very prestigious for uh, anyone who had an aspiration to a career as a musician. Almost every ship had its own orchestra. They called it orchestras that rarely be more than eight, perhaps ten players. Some ships would only have a quartet, for example, but they played a uh, very essential role in providing entertainment for second and third class passengers on the Titanic. And these men were very much unknowns at the time of the Titanic sailing, but within a week of the ship leaving Southampton, they were world famous. Unfortunately, none of them survived the disaster. They're remembered to this day because of their actions during the disaster itself. And then you had third class, which I don't want to say is necessarily nameless and faceless. There's nothing that really stands out about them except their character. These were people, they were not ignorant sheep herders or recently liberated serfs from Russia. Or, there, were, there were a few of the type on board. But what was really surprising was the number of professionals, doctors, dentists, woodworkers, electricians, who were leaving Great Britain for the United States. And all these people were really interested. They weren't interested in second class and third and first class accommodations. They were interested in clean, safe passage to America as inexpensively as possible because they were going there to start a new life. Now, a third-class ticket on the, the Titanic could cost as little as $36, which was not an inconsiderable sum in, 19, in 1912, but certainly for someone who managed their money and was able to spend some time saving, certainly was a, a realistic amount of money to accumulate to start an entirely new life in the new world. And that's one of the really surprising things about third-class not just that these were the poorest of the poor, but some of the best brains and some of the uh, well-educated people in Great Britain were starting to leave Britain because Britain was, be was just beginning her decline as the leading industrial power of the world. And that role was shifting in the United States and there was no opportunity in America than there was in Great Britain. So that's in kind of a broad brush approach, that's one of the more meaningful ways of looking at third class, that these weren't the dregs and rejects of the society. They weren't the tired, the poor, the huddled masses. The inscription on the Statue of Liberty implies that they should have been. All right. And very quickly, you mentioned in there that a third class ticket cost $76. Uh, generally, what were the ticket costs associated with first and second class for this maiden voyage of Titanic? There was an incredible spectrum in, uh, in both first and second class. Uh, you could pay as much as $4,500 for a, a suite in first class. Um, it even had its own private promenade deck. And there were a cabin in first class where the Little as $180. Second class would be anywhere in the $100 to $50, $200 range. Uh, again, depending on exactly, you know, whether you had an inside cabin, an outside cabin, how close you were to the dining room, things like that. This, the same things that affect the prices of cabins on cruise ships today had an effect on the cost of the uh, your accommodations on a uh, transatlantic liner at the turn of the century. All right. So uh, now that we have some context on who was on board, how much they spent, what the conditions were like, let's turn to the sequence of events that led to the sinking of the Titanic. So what exactly transpired that led up to the sinking? You know, everyone knows about the iceberg, but what, what led up to that? Was this preventable? Were there warning signs? What exactly did that sequence of events look like? This is one of the most amazing series of events that I have ever encountered in all my years of research. The only one that comes close is how the American military missed all of the, when I say missed, basically misinterpreted and misread all of the intelligence 
that it had uh, Japanese intentions prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. That has to be read to be believed. But with the Titanic, it's almost incredible because the chain of events that led to the encounter between the iceberg and the Titanic began within minutes of the ship leaving the ocean dock in South Amy. She was involved in a near collision with an ocean liner called the New York. The sheer bulk of the Titanic as it moved through the water created a tremendous amount of suction. That suction pulled the liner New York from its moorings at a nearby dock and drew the stern of the New York within three feet, literally three feet, of the side of the Titanic before tugs were able to get the New York under control and, and pull her away. Now, Captain Smith stopped the ship, ordered the ship to be sounded, that is, checked for damage, potential flooding, anything related to the mishap that could affect the operation of the ship. That delayed the Titanic leaving Southampton Harbor, sailing down the Itchen and into the English Channel. That delayed her by an hour. Now, the interesting thing is she never made up that hour. She reached the point where she encountered the iceberg. She was still an hour behind schedule. This is where the weird, almost unimaginable starts. On the 14th of April, 1912, there were six, some say seven, separate warnings regarding ice, either directly across the Titanic's projected course or close enough to the Titanic's projected course where it might present a hazard. There was no SOP, that is no standard operating procedure at the time, for how these warnings were handled by the wireless operators in terms of getting them to the officers on the bridge, whether it was the captain, first officer, chief officer, second officer, whoever was the officer to watch it at any given time. So nobody on board the ship had all six or seven of these messages in front of them at any one time. So nobody was able to put this picture together that, oh my God, there is this immense ice that is stretching right across our projected track, and we may have to take precautions. Now, Captain Smith did alter course slightly, 10 miles farther south than the course he would usually take to avoid the ice of which he had seen a couple of reports which were just to the north of the Titanic's projected track. He didn't know that the ice field stretched completely across it. So, it's the second link in the chain. The third link is the speed that the Titanic was going at. If she'd been going half a knot faster, the lookouts would not have been able to see the Titanic in time to avoid a direct collision, rather than the side swipe she actually performed against against the iceberg, and this would have led not necessarily to a direct head-on collision, but a more violent collision that, while it would have caused more damage to the bow of the ship, would very likely have created that scenario where a couple of adjacent watertight compartments flooded, but they weren't enough to give the ship a sufficient bow-down trim so that the compartments aft began flooding in succession. If the ship had been traveling half a knot slower, there would have been just enough time for the helm orders that First Officer Murdoch gave to swing the bow of the ship and then the side of the ship away from the iceberg, avoiding the collision entirely. Now we have the Titanic meeting the iceberg. Remember, I said that she could float with any she could float with any two adjacent watertight components float. She could float with the first four from the bow back. She could remain afloat indefinitely, with no danger of sinking, if the first four watertight compartments were open to the sea. Once that fifth compartment opened to the sea, the inrush of seawater would be would create enough weight inside the hull to bring the bow down and start that succession of flooding over adjacent bulkheads. And one by one, bow aft, the watertight compartments would start to 
making the end a mathematical certainty. Well, as it turned out, the encounter with the iceberg opened up the first six water taking moments. Now, you remember when I said that she was an hour behind schedule when she finally left Southampton? This is where that hour comes in because the iceberg that she struck was what was known as a blue berg. This is an iceberg that has, because icebergs start to melt as soon as they fall into the ocean. When they, when they melt, they of course melt asymmetrically and their center of gravity will shift and the iceberg will sometimes turn over. Part of the iceberg that was submerged is full of seawater. There's no, no rhyme of ice covering it. So it's very, very dark. The Titanic, as I said, struck a blue berg. This was an iceberg that had overturned sometime in the last 20 to 30 minutes before the encounter with the Titanic. If the Titanic had been on schedule, the berg itself would have been your typical white, ghostly iceberg, which would have stood out even though very low light conditions of the night sufficient light to give a little bit of illumination to a white iceberg, allowing the lookouts to see it in time to move over. Because this berg had turned over, it was dark, so you had an almost black iceberg floating on a black ocean against a black sky, and the lookouts didn't see it in time. And that's where that hour comes into play, that hour that she never made up. And of course, as I say, you have the, the fact that she struck she struck the iceberg in the only way possible to cause her to sink. If she had struck the iceberg any other way, she wouldn't have taken enough damage to cause her to sufficiently violate her watertight integrity and cause her to sink. But it was that side swiping of the bird that punched a series of holes. And these holes were not big. Based on the visible rate of flooding that was reported to Thomas Andrews, her designer, her, her builder, at the time, there was perhaps 12 square feet total open to the sea that the water was, was coming in. Total of 12 square feet. That's smaller than your average, typical door in your average home. That's all that it took. But the holes were in the right, or in this case, the wrong place. And the flooding took place. It was uncontrollable because the pumps that were available were designed to keep water out of the boiler rooms and the engine room. They did not have the connections to pump water out of the forward quarter of the ship. And so the weight of water became unbearable, pulled the bow down, and the just in succession, each watertight compartment began to flood as the one next to it filled up with water. As the water rose above the, the top of the adjacent bulkhead, spilled over, that compartment began flooding. It filled up, it pulled the bow a little farther down, sufficient to let the water flow into the next compartment, and the next, and the next. And her end, her end was mathematical certainty. The way that she struck the berg was the only way that she could have suffered the damage necessary to cause her to sink. One of the best ways to make money online is via email marketing. Even with the prevalence of social media use, building an email list and writing interesting, informative, and entertaining emails as part of a strategy to sell to the people on your list is still possibly the best and most effective way to make sales and increase your revenue. I use ConvertKit for my email list with the Places and Profiles podcast, and I highly recommend it. ConvertKit is a tremendous platform with a great reputation and is designed specifically for creators, bloggers, podcasters, and online business owners. ConvertKit has tremendous functionality and is very intuitive and easy to use. Get your email marketing set up today for your blog, podcast, or online business by going to placesandprofiles.com slash convert. Again, that's placesandprofiles.com slash convert. All right, so the Titanic suffers this damage because of the way it strikes the berg, and it does sink. So the next step is going to be the rescue efforts. So what did these rescue efforts look like? Um, of course, the Carpathia and its involvement is quite well known. 
but what other vessels were involved? What was the Carpathia's involvement in these rescue efforts? Uh, who received preferential treatment in these rescue efforts? What can you tell us about the rescue efforts for the Titanic, what they looked like, and, and how successful they were? They were a mixed bag. And what I mean by that is, first off, the Titanic, as everyone knows, did not carry enough lifeboat capacity for everyone who was on board the ship that night. This was not unusual. There was no ship on the North Atlantic run that carried sufficient lifeboats for that ship's maximum capacity of passengers and crew. None of the ships did. The Ile de France, French liner, came the closest. She had an 87% passenger and crew capacity for her lifeboats. But for the Titanic, she was required to carry 16 standard lifeboats that together had a capacity of 990 people. The White Star Line added four collapsible lifeboats, canvas, wooden, solid wooden keel canvas sides that could be, could be raised as the, the boat was launched, which raised her lifeboat capacity to 1,128. Unfortunately, there were 2,207 people on board the Titanic. So even if every lifeboat was filled to capacity, there was going to be 1,100 people, more or less, left behind on the ship's deck. Half the people on board were going to die, simply because there was no place for them to go. People argue that this was some heinous crime on the part of the White Star Line. Well, it wasn't. The White Star Line not only complied with, but exceeded every safety regulation on the books at the time. The British Board of Trade had formulated these lifeboat requirements 20 years before the Titanic disaster and had, despite the increase, the rapid increase in the size of ocean liners that I talked about at the beginning of this podcast, the Board of Trade never revised its lifeboat requirements in all of that time. So you had a 20-year-old lifeboat requirement lifeboat capacity that was really adhered to by the White Star Line. But like, as I say, it was 20 years out of date and it, it had been made obsolete by the advances in, sh in shipbuilding in those two intervening two decades. That was, the that was the first problem. The second problem was getting people into the boats. This is, this is something that, that, that gets conveniently overlooked by a lot of people who are trying to they have social agendas that they want to advance. They, they have sociopolitical axes they want to grind. And they conveniently overlook the fact that the first few boats that were launched were launched with barely half their filled, were filled to barely half the capacity because people had believed the myth of the unsinkable ship. They refused to leave the Titanic to get into. An open lifeboat. I'm, I, the, the name of the, the woman escapes me. It was, it was a first class passenger who, when asked to get into, it was lifeboat number three, she said to First Officer Murdoch, We're much safer here than we are in that little open boat. She just refused, she flat out refused to get into the boats. Uh, a lot of women would not get into the boats unless there were some men that were allowed in because, again, given the the social climate of the day was felt that women need to be protected and that it was the duty of the men to protect them. So a trickle of men were allowed into the, into the lifeboats. But at first, people were flat out refusing to get into the boats. These boats were launched nonetheless. Then you had the problem of third class. Third class, which was down in the bow and the stern sections of the ship, had to make their way to the very top of the ship, which is where the boat deck is located. They didn't know the route. There, were, there weren't posted charts and diagrams showing them how to get there. And it took them, in some cases, an eternity to get to the boat decks. Again, one of the myths that has sprung up and has clung limpet like to the Titanic is that the third-class passengers were locked below decks because the White Star Line – 
was reserving the lifeboats for the first and second class passengers. Uh uh-uh. Not like that at all. Yes, third class passengers were locked below decks. They were locked below decks because they were required to be locked there by American immigration laws. Again, we run into an example of regulations that were written and never revised in the light of experience in the the passenger trade. One of the problems that had plagued immigration into America in the mid and later 19th century was that there were a lot of immigrants were coming on board who weren't healthy. They had some of them, you know, let's be blunt, some of them were carrying lice, some of them were carrying communicable diseases. And the American government had instituted regulations requiring these passengers, third class passengers, be physically separated with locked barricades from the rest of the ship. What you had was a situation, though, that events had outmoded these regulations because an additional American immigration regulation said that any immigrant who was denied entry into the United States had to be returned to his port of departure at the carrier's expense. So rather than taking the risk of having to transport somebody all the way across the Atlantic and then bring them right back again, the British began instituting very quick but very thorough physicals of third-class passengers before they were allowed to embark. And anyone who had any kind of visible open wound who exhibited symptoms of any disease, there was a disease of the eye that was extremely communicable. The medical name escapes me at the moment that was guaranteed. And all that all that was required to determine whether or not the person had it was to lift up the, the eyelid, look at the interior of the eyelid. And this would guarantee that passenger was not was not a reward. So the need for the barricades wasn't there, but the regulation was never rescinded. And if the regulation was not followed, the ship would not be allowed to dock in New York or Boston or wherever its port of call would happen to be. In the United States. So you had outdated government regulations were now dictating the fate of people who you know, their only chance of survival was, was to get to, at least onto the upper decks. And there were only a handful of stewards who had the keys to these locked barricades. There are no accounts, there are no contemporary accounts of these barricades being locked in the faces of the third-class passengers as they tried to make their way up to the decks because those barricades had been locked and secured before the ship ever moved south end. There are recorded instances of some stewards and crewmen who had keys opening the opening what gates and barricades they had the keys for. Not a systematic effort on the part of the White Star Line to keep these people Below deference to the first and second class, it was it was almost something worse. It was negligence, and it was a negligence that was shared by not only the White Star Line and all the other passenger lines, but by the British and American governments as well. So what you had was that as the last boats were being filled and lowered, you had this sudden upsurge of people from third class who had finally found routes to the upper decks and now they're standing around on the boat deck on a deck in the the in the after well deck on the poop deck no place to go no lifeboats left for them they're gonna have to take their chances with 30 degree water and hypothermia takes depending on the individual anywhere from 8 to 12 minutes to set in and consciousness to supervene and once you lose consciousness in hyperthermic conditions, death follows me. So what was the role of Carpathia in the rescue efforts? And what were some of the other ships that were heavily involved in the rescue efforts for the passengers that were successfully saved from the Titanic? Yeah, the only ship that actually picked up survivors was the Carpathia. She was 70 miles away when wireless operator 
picked up the Titanic's distress call, and her captain, Arthur Rostrum, he immediately turned the ship around. He was eastbound, and he immediately turned the ship around and drove her as hard as he could to get to the Titanic as quickly as he could. Unfortunately, he arrived about an hour and a half after the Titanic had gone down, and basically by then, anyone who was going to survive was someone who was in a boat, and there were 705 survivors. He very methodically and systematically, the man basically wrote the book on how to conduct a rescue and see in terms of organizing his crew, its facilities, keeping control of his own passengers to keep them from getting underfoot. And he very meticulously, it was, it was superb seamanship on his part, to, uh, he, he picked up all of the 20 lifeboats. Most of them he took aboard the ship. A few of them he abandoned because there was no place to put them. He brought everyone who was alive aboard. No one else picked up survivors. No one else was able to get to the Titanic, to the site of the Titanic sinking in time. Now, there was a, a ship called the Mount Temple, which was as close, if not closer, than the Carpathian. But she was to the west of the Titanic, and she was on the other side of that ice field. There was no way for her to get through the ice field in time to reach the Titanic's position. By the time she did, um, the Carpathia had rescued all the survivors. There was, however, a third ship, known as the California, which was, depending on estimates, anywhere from five to ten miles away from the Titanic while she was sinking. Her officers watched the Titanic sink, they reported to their captain that they were watching this steamer to the south behaving very strangely. They, she was firing white rockets, which was an international signal of distress in 1912. And what should we do about this, Captain? Well, the captain was named Stanley Lord, and his response was to very energetically do nothing. I have my own theories as to why he did so, I discuss it in my book, The Other Side of the Night, Carpathia, the Californian, and the Lord of the Titanic is lost. I'm not going to go into all of them here. But what it boiled down to was that there was clear and incontrovertible evidence that the ship to the south of the Californian was in distress. Now, keep in mind, distress at sea means one thing and one thing only. Somebody, somewhere, is about to die. This ship to the south is floating in a strange way. She is sending up white rockets, and the captain of the Californian essentially ignores her. Now, was this ship the Titanic? There's been a lot of manipulation, evidence, and records over the years to try and exonerate Captain Lord and, ex and exculpate him from any responsibility. But the observed movements of the ship to the south coupled with the observed movements from the Titanic of the ship to the north coincided perfectly, plus the number of rockets that were fired by the Titanic corresponded to the number of rockets that were seen by the officers of the California. There was no requirement in 1912 for a 24-hour wireless, that is, radio launch. So the Californian's wireless operator never heard the Titanic CQDs and SMSs. And for some reason, Stanley Lord never bothered to wake his wireless up. Now, I'm not saying, and I want to make this point strongly, I'm not saying that had the Californian intervened, she could have saved everyone on board the Titanic. No, that would not have happened. She could have easily saved three, four, or five hundred people had Captain Lord acted with some promptitude and responsibility. But as it was, there was no activity on the part of the Californian, and 1,200 people died. All right, so a few more questions before we wrap up. But now that we've looked at the sinking, we've looked at the rescue efforts to try to save passengers from perishing in the Titanic. Uh, so let's talk about the aftermath and some of the key components of that. So what sort of legal action was taken? How did ocean liners change moving forward? What came of the people that survived this disaster? What, what are some of the key things to know about the aftermath of the sinking of the Titanic? 
Well, first of all, there were two official inquiries into the loss of the Titanic, one by the American Senate and the other conducted by the British Board of Trade. Of the two, the Board of Trade inquiry was more extensive, more technically oriented, and it's regarded as a masterpiece of inquiry. But the conclusions that the, the board came to are considered to this day to be a whitewash, basically because what you had was you had a situation where the Board of Trade was investigating itself. This is a Board of Trade inquiry into the validity uh, and effectiveness of Board of Trade regulations. It was generally considered that they were not going to come down very hard on themselves as a result. Most of what we know about the events that occurred on the Titanic as she was sinking and in the days leading up to the sinking came out of the inquiry. It's very dense reading and got to really sift through it to be able to sort out truth, conjecture, speculation, faulty memory, etc. But it's all in there. Now, the American inquiry was a far less formal proceeding. It, it actually came before the, the British inquiry, but it was chaired by uh, William Alden Smith, who was a senior senator in the state of Michigan, and he wanted to know how is it possible for a ship of this size to sail across the Atlantic, encounter an iceberg, and there are lifeboats for only half the people aboard? That was was, was the, the main thrust of his um, of his investigation was not how did the disaster happen. That was actually fairly effectively answered in the British Board of Trade investigation. The American inquiry was asking. Not how did this happen? How did this many people die and why? And the two inquiries agreed in the end, not by consensus, but agreed independently of each other, that the first thing that would need to be done would be regulations that were very simple. Ships will carry a lifeboat capacity equal to or in excess of its total capacity of passengers and crew. You're going to carry 3,000 passengers and crew. You're going to have lifeboats for 3,000 people. Within weeks, nearly identical regulations were uh, put forward in both the United States and Great Britain to that effect. There were some changes to the sea lanes, the routes that the uh, ships would take in the months where the ice fields were the heaviest in the North Atlantic. Um, the International Ice Patrol was formed as a result, which would note and monitor the presence of ice in the North Atlantic that imperiled shipping lanes. And nobody believed in the unsinkable ship anymore. It was seen as tempting fate, tempting God, however you want to phrase it. It was something that no one wanted to contemplate ever again. This is just too big. This is arrogance carried beyond the point of presumption. There is an a series of international treaties and regulations known as SOLA, Safety of Life at Sea, that regulates the number, type, and location of lifeboats on passenger-carrying ships, whether they be ocean liners, cruise ships, ferries, any ship, any ocean-going or any ship that carries passengers on a major waterway is regulated by SOLAS, basically to ensure that there is never going to be another Titanic disaster. Now, unfortunately, the enforcement of SOLAS is, by some com countries, observed or is honored more in the breach than the observance. In the Far East, for example, we all are aware of a remarkable chain of tragedies regarding the uh, various fer inter-island ferries. Uh, particularly in the Philippines, where ships are overloaded and uh, are carrying far more people than they're certified to carry. Uh, they're mishandled. They suffer collisions. They get caught in storms. They run aground and sink with significant loss of life. Then you have uh, situations like the Costa Concordia over a decade ago, where you basically had a captain who was a nincompoop. 
and was more interested in getting amorous with his mistress than he was in the safe navigation of his ship. And he ran his cruise ship aground on the rocks of minor in the middle of a island in the Mediterranean. The ship sank. There was loss of life. Nothing would approach the death of the Titanic, but it was still an avoidable loss of life. There's no there's never going to be any foolproof protection from stupidity. But reasonable efforts were immediately taken to guarantee that there would not be a repeat of the Titanic. And outside of wartime, there has never been a passenger ship of any description lost with the proportion of lives lost to those carried by the ship. So, and nothing approaching the actual numbers that were lost. There have been ships in wartime that were sunk with greater loss of life, but that was literally through the combat, the action of the, the lowest combatants, not the circumstances of ship versus nature. All right. So before we wrap up, I want to look at a couple of places where we've seen a continuing interest and fascination with the Titanic and its sinking in the 111 years since the ill-fated maiden voyage of the ship. Uh, And one of the places we see this is in popular culture. Of course, there's the famous 1997 James Cameron-directed movie with Leonardo DiCaprio called Titanic. Um, But Titanic is one of these events that really has seeped into popular culture in any number of ways. Uh, So what are some of the things, and you've already talked about this a little bit, but what are some of the things that pop culture and the way that that has influenced our perception of the Titanic. What are some of the things that popular culture gets right about the Titanic and its sinking? And what are some of the things that it gets wrong about the Titanic and its sinking? Well, let's start out with the best known example, James Cameron's 1997 film, Titanic. The ship was created, was recreated flawless, but that's about as far as it goes. There was a tremendous amount of fiction in that script, both in terms of how the classes interacted, how they were allowed to interact, where various people were allowed to go. The famous flying scene, for example, where Jack and Rose are standing at the very bow of the ship. could have never happened because that was a working area of the ship. Passengers weren't allowed up there. There is also a very very obvious and heavy-handed social axe that Cameron grinds in this picture in which the poor, virtuous, third-class passengers are the victims of the evil, greedy, oppressive first-class passengers. Second-class never gets mentioned in that entire film. Not once is second-class mentioned. This is important. 84% of the third-class passengers were lost. A lot of hoopla is made over the fact that A third of the men in first class survived compared to the horrible casualties in third class. But what does that really mean? That means two-thirds of the men in first class died. In second class, 95% of the male passengers went down with the ship because there there were socially imposed moral imperatives that dictated the behavior of these men in times of crisis. And that was the, the classic stiff upper lip, go to your grave with a you know, whip on your lips and a song in your heart, but never show weakness in the face of danger. To me, it's, it's, it's horribly significant. Yes, a third, a third of the first class men survived. Two thirds of them died. And they knew they were going to die. That's the, that's the thing. They knew they were going to die. Because of the men who survived in first class, you recall... I said that women initially refused to get in the boats unaccompanied without at least some men getting in along with them. And usually it was the first class men who were immediately available, who were asked or in some cases ordered to get into the boats. And those men make up the majority of survivors from first class. Those who didn't survive didn't because they stayed behind with a moral imperative of their class, of not just first class aboard the ship, but their social economic standing it was a moral imperative that they stay behind. English, British middle class values and the, the second class on the Titanic 
is almost entirely British in composition. The British middle class social values, again, demanded the same thing, that a man will give up his space in a lifeboat for a woman or a child. So there's a very skewed presentation of life aboard the Titanic in Cameron's film. It's also one of the, the sources of the gates being slammed shut in the face of the third-class passengers. Yes, and it's uh, unfortunately it's become pervasive in much of the public consciousness. There has been a Broadway musical called Titanic, in which there's tremendous conflict between uh, members of the various classes in terms of who is responsible for it. Are the owners responsible for the ship and the and, and the collision because they were driving the, the captain too hard to make a record setting passage, which, by the way, was not possible. Titanic could have never set the transatlantic speed limit. She just didn't have the horsepower, literally. But that's been, that's what was a huge success. In 2012, there was a BBC presentation by Julian Fellows called Titanic. And it was basically an upstairs, downstairs type of uh, narrative of the Titanic disaster. Think Downton Abbey at sea, and you've got Titanic, UDC. There's been a myriad of books, some good some bad, a lot of them indifferent, that have covered the ship in amazing detail. The research on several of the, of the authors, utterly remarkable for how deep and dedicated they have been. We haven't had a rock opera yet. I'm expecting that at some point. But it's been a part of the major media of the early 20th century that really won't go away because... It is seeped so deep on both sides of the Atlantic. All right, and one final place that we see the continuing fascination with the Titanic, and this is where we'll wrap up for today. Um, but that's with these continued manned tourist dives to the wreck. Uh, of course, this was in the news earlier this year when the Titan submersible imploded, uh, and there were casualties from that tragedy. But when did these commercial dives, these tourist dives to the wreck, when did they begin? What What's come of those? What, what can you tell us about these, uh, these continued manned commercial or tourist dives to the wreckage of the Titanic? Okay, let me begin by making it very clear. I am a maritime and military historian. Uh, I'm not a deep sea marine engineer, so I can't specifically address, I, I, I can't directly address the specifics of the Ocean Gate Titan incident. I'm not qualified to. There's been a lot of lip flapping on the part of people who don't have the credentials to speak to the subject, but they feel that because they have access to the internet, they're entitled to yap about it. I will offer my opinion on the idea of tourist dives to the Titanic. Now, until very recently, when I say very recently, within the last five to seven years, to examine the wreck, it was necessary to physically go down to the wreck in manned submersibles to take photographs, um, make observations. We're learning a lot about the deep ocean and its the, the little mini ecologies that live down there and the process by which shipwrecks are gradually broken down and, and disintegrate, we're learning a lot from the Titanic because we have several data that we can follow from the discovery of the wreck in 1985 right up until just uh, a year ago when a mapping, a sonar mapping up an expedition with the latest in 3D modeling software was employed to give an incredibly detailed picture of the entire wreck area. How stern, the debris field, all the debris that's scattered around the wreck that um, previously been ignored by earlier expeditions. So there's a lot that has been learned, but there is a point now where the necessity of manned expeditions no longer exists. The technology of observing the ship remotely has evolved to the point where 
the, for want of a better term, the granularity of the information and especially the imagery that is is being brought back from these remotely operated vehicles far surpasses the capabilities of uh, human observers on manned dives, in large part because these remotely operated vehicles are capable of operating instruments in spectrums that both visual and electronic spectrums, which are completely beyond the capability of a human being. You know, they're beyond the capability of the eye to perceive and the, you know, the, the electronic, the electronic uh, examinations, the, the 3D sonar and the processing of the images is something that, the, uh, that, that far surpasses human ability. So what you have now are these tourist dots. People are paying ridiculous, and I, I to me, $250,000 to spend three hours on the you know, circling a, a small section of the Titanic wreck just to say that you've been there is a ridiculous amount of money. And that's really all it is. It's bragging rights. The, the tourist dives started in the early 2000s, and they've continued on and off ever since. Basically, they're dictated by when the deep sea submersibles that are rated to the depth the Titanic sits at are available. And the prices that are, are asked um, the customers, and that's what they are, their customers, are justified, reasonably so, because these are incredibly expensive vehicles. But it really does come down to bragging rights. I, you know, you can say, well, I've been to the Titanic. You're a tourist. You haven't contributed anything to the knowledge, the body of knowledge that has accumulated from exploring the world. You've just been a set of eyeballs that looked at it. It's something that you can cross off your bucket list. But what have you really accomplished? Oh, great. I sat inside a titanium sphere, no technical skills. I was basically human ballast. Boom, we went down, we puttered around for three hours, I came back, and now I can put, put a plaque on my wall that says that I visited the working of the Titanic. It accomplishes nothing, but because there is a profit motive in certain areas of deep sea technology, there are people who are willing to exploit that desire to pointlessly visit the wreck and charge ridiculous amounts of money for the to say, I've been there. It's kind of like, it's becoming like Mount Everest. It's becoming, it, it's on the cusp of, of if, if, if it's not stopped, Soon, it's going to become a little mid cottage industry. Is, is very, um, but you know, you go up to Everest. Your chance, if you summit Everest, your chances are one in sixteen. You're not, you know, until just a few months ago, we never had an accident occur around the wreck. I have a good friend, Mike Harris, who nearly died over twenty years ago in an incident on the wreck. The submersible that he was in, and he was part of an exploration team, a genuine scientific exploration team. His submersible got trapped under a section of the stern. And for, I think, the better part of 16 hours, they tried to free the uh, submersible. It was very much a life-threatening situation. It, it, as I say, it was part of a legitimate exploratory. So the potential for loss of life for disaster has always been there. What I cannot in any semblance of good conscience can be known, courage is the idea of going down to the wreck, taking the risk simply to say, I've done it. It's not that big a deal. It really isn't. You're not going to learn, you're not going to learn any more about the Titanic once you've been to the Titanic. You will not have learned any more about it than you knew before you did. All right. So on that note, uh, we'll wrap up for today. But before we go, uh, Dan, can you take a minute, remind the listeners about where they can follow your work and any books that you recommend they take a look at? Well, uh, first off, I will highly recommend two books about the Titanic. One is called Unsinkable, the whole story of RMS Titanic, published initially by Stackpole Books. And the other is The Other Side of the Night, Carpathia the Californian, who the Titanic Law was lost, which is published by Casemate. Both of them were written by someone I'm very familiar with, in fact, on a first name basis, we 
his name is Daniel Allen Butler. And um, I highly recommend those. I highly recommend Walter Lord's two books in the Titanic. The first being A Night to Remember. The second being The Night Lives On. Don Lynch published a book back in early, mid to late 90s, an illustrated history. I believe it's called An Illustrated History of the Titanic, which offers some magnificent views of the interior of the ship, some visual recreations done by Ken Marshall, whose passion for both men have an absolute passion for the Titanic. There have been so many, it's hard to keep track of them. What I don't want to do is I do, I, I do not want to sit here and say I don't recommend this, that, or the other title. But, um, I would definitely recommend those. If you can find a, a copy of Jeffrey Marcus' the Maiden Voyage, snatch it up. It's rare these days. Uh, it was published back in the late 60s, but it's definitely worth having. So I would, uh, that's, that's my, recommend, my recommended list. All right. Well, oh, yes. One thing. One thing I do want to point out: um, the complete transcripts of the American Inquiry and the British Inquiry are available online. If memory serves. The, uh, the website is titled Titanic Inquiry Online. I believe it's Titanic Inquiry Online dot com, might and maybe dot org, but it. The title is uh, Titanic Inquiry Online, and it is, for anyone who's a serious student of the Titanic, those are your, those are your go-to primary documents. All right. Well, a reminder for everyone listening that the show notes page for this episode is placesandprofiles.com slash seven. So all of the books that were just mentioned, including the two that Dan himself wrote, Unsinkable, the full story of the RMS Titanic, and Other Side of the Night, the Carpathia, the Californian, and the Night the Titanic was Lost. All of those books, including those two, will be linked on the show notes page. The inquiry transcripts will be linked there. So all kinds of resources and links related to the Titanic in today's episode will be available at placesandprofiles.com slash seven. So that's the place to go for this episode, placesandprofiles.com slash seven. And Dan, I want to thank you so much again for joining me today and for being so generous with your time uh, as we took a look I, at I, the I, Titanic. So thank you so much. I enjoyed myself immensely. Adam, thank you for having me. And um, I'm looking forward to following your, your whole succession of podcasts. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And um, perhaps in the future, we'll have you back on to talk about Pearl Harbor or another topic that you've studied over the years. So I would, lo I would love, love the opportunity. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Places and Profiles podcast. Please visit placesandprofiles.com to subscribe and listen to more episodes. Come back again soon, and thanks for listening.